All right, we are officially recording. Um, welcome to the new monthly Kubernetes contributor uh, community meeting. I think I got that all in the right order. I just want to remind everybody that we do have a code of conduct, so please be aware of that. Be excellent to one another, and we will get started. Um, as a courtesy, please do mute when you are not speaking. That way, everybody is sure they can be heard. And but you're feel free to unmute if you would like to be part of the discussion. And uh, my name is Lara Santa Maria. I am from Log DNA, and I'm also part of SIG Contributor Experience. So I'm also the one responsible for this meeting now. And we're trying out a new format. So we'll see how this goes. Um, I don't think we have a note taker yet. If somebody could take over that, that'd be great. And thank you, Bob, for dropping that in the Zoom chat. So if somebody could grab the notes, we'll see how much we keep up with. If not, I'll keep up with it, but we'll see. All right, well, while somebody is thinking about becoming the note taker, I will take it. Just a couple quick announcements. Um, this is the new updated community meeting format. So afterwards, we'd love to hear your thoughts on what you thought about the whole experience. Feel free to reach out to me, uh, lara.santamaria at logini.com, or you can reach out to us on Slack. You'll be able to find me there. And uh, yeah, that doc's overloaded. So we're gonna just keep going and it'll be very entertaining as we go. Um, but that's the only really big announcement that I have in terms of this community meeting. And if you have announcements for next time, please do let me know. A uh, couple notes about release updates. Uh, so 1.21.0 was first released earlier this month on April 8th. Congratulations to the release team. Uh, the retro was held on April 15th. So that I think was earlier this week or last week. It was last week. I know what day it is. That's perfectly fine. Um, some patch release updates for you. There is a link to the patch releases doc, but there's some upcoming patches. So 1.18.19 release target is the 28th of April. Uh, 1.19.11 cherry pick deadline of May 7th release target May 12th. 1.20.7, same cherry pick deadline and release target as with 1.21.1. And there were some patches released as of April 15th, as well as the big release uh, from 1.21.0, and that's 1.18.18, 1.19.10, and 1.20.6. So that's the quick update on the releases. And on that note, now we get to the fun part, which is discussions. And we're going to be starting with the release cadence, KEP, which is from our release team. And we have Jeremy here to kind of be my, be my expert because I don't know everything about this KEP, no matter how much I read about it. Uh, welcome, Jeremy. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me. I'm, uh, I'm excited to talk about this topic. Yay. It's near and dear to my heart for the last few weeks. Um, so in Yay. essence... In essence, what this uh, this change, you know, kept our proposals for um, changing Kubernetes. They could be changing Kubernetes in terms of code, so it could be like a new feature. We're also using them to propose uh, policy changes, uh, and this one is specifically around the release cadence for Kubernetes. So in 2020, uh, due to the, the many things that happened in the world. Um, you know, we, we slowed the, the 119 release down and extended it quite a bit to just give everybody breathing room, um, just to kind of take space to, uh, to deal with all the events that were unfolding. What that ended up doing was leaving um, not enough time to do two more releases in, in the rest of the year. So we ended up with three releases in 2020. And during that time, there was a lot of discussion uh, in various places. Um, it's, it's hard to pull all the, all the threads together to find all of the comments and all of the discussion that had happened. But uh, going forward, we thought that we thought SIG release proposed uh, a kind of adopting that formally. So instead of the four releases that normally would have happened once a quarter, moving to a cadence that's three releases. There's a few, you know, a few reasons that we thought about doing this. Um, you know, one, it it's a lot of overhead to build the releases out and maintain the various branches. And this will give us a little bit of breathing room from the release team's perspective, but also from uh, from the consumer's perspective, it's really hard to keep up. Uh, speaking from pr previous experience, it's hard to keep up with the 
you know, the number of releases and when things fall out of support, you have to try to catch up really quickly. And uh, one of the benefits of the, the slowdown in 2020 was that people had a little bit more breathing room. Things stayed in support for a little bit longer. And we just kind of wanted to formalize that. So really what the PEP uh, at a really high level is proposing is some rough guidance on planning release calendars. And the guidance kind of breaks down into a few things, three real bullet points. One is that releases should be around 15 weeks. Uh, previously, they were much shorter than that, um, 12, 10, 11, 12 weeks, depending on where it fell on the calendar. So this isn't like a great big difference. It, it's not like 119 where it was very, very long, but it does add just enough breathing room, I think, to, to, to move deadlines around a little bit, give people a little bit more time to get things into the release, give it a little more time to plan things for the next release as well. The second thing is that it's going to build, bake in a little bit of downtime between each release. Um, from the release team's perspective, one of the things that's great about uh, cycle to cycle is that we onboard a whole bunch of new contributors, um, some experienced contributors to the release team as shadows to learn the roles and help with staff the release teams going forward. And it's always a challenge to get that done, especially for some of the roles like enhancements that have to hit the ground running. Uh, speaking as a previous enhancements lead, I know like it's really hard to pick the shadows in time to get them really, really engaged because we, you know, we hit the ground as soon as the release officially kicks off, uh, trying to collect all of the, the caps that are going to make it into the release and make sure the authors are pushing those things forward. So this will give us a little bit more time to, to do that, but also to plan the, you know, to get the schedule firmed out and, uh, and not rushed uh, to make sure we get all of the, like right now the, the 122 schedule uh, is being discussed. There's a PR that's open for that. Uh, I can, after I'm done talking, I can go grab the, the link and drop it into uh, into the notes. But essentially, you know, there's, there's feedback coming in. And when we have less time to get that finalized, it kind of rushes that process. So that's the second bullet point, two weeks of, of downtime. And then the third thing that we did during 2020, uh, and we really did this during the 119 release and the, the 120 release, was give time for KubeCon to occur. Generally, KubeCon occurs during one of the releases, probably two of the releases during the year. And it's, you know, in person, it's really, really hard to, to focus on any of the release team activities. When things are online, it's still difficult. Like you, you're still trying to focus your attention on, on KubeCon and, and not having to worry about getting uh, you know, any of the release team meetings, getting reviews done, no deadlines landing in that week. So the third bullet point of this kind of rough policy is that we're gonna block out that week from any activities occurring from the release team's perspective. There won't be any deadlines that week. We won't have release team meetings. We're also gonna treat the week before and after kind of as, as a loose, um, uh, also kind of blackout period, but uh, not as formal as that, that one week period. So with those three things in mind, those those three kind of release planning things, in the cap, we've, we've kind of um, spelled out what 2021 would look like with a, a three release cadence and what 2022 would look like with a three release cadence. And what you end up seeing is that we end up with um, a release in April. We really end up with a release in August and we end up with a release in December. So with those three things, it's pretty predictable to know you know, when this release is going to happen down to a week or two, you know, depending on how things shift within the year. Um, the cap is currently approved by almost everybody that needs to approve it. We're still waiting for sick testing to weigh in, but everybody else uh, has provided such great feedback. We've had a lot of uh, back and forth, a lot of really great intense collaboration to get this to the point where it's ready to go. Um, I would invite everybody to, uh, to go check it out, um, but at a high level, three things coming. 15 week releases, two weeks between releases, no, no uh, release activities during KubeCon, and that will result in three releases per year. Awesome. I know, I'm pretty excited about that. Does anybody have any questions, anything they would love to discuss about it? Comments? Yeah, um, do you wanna also talk about how we're going to, uh, uh, oh. it's a bit TBD, but how we're going to evaluate whether or not this change is successful? Yeah, thanks for, for, I totally spaced on that one. Um, so what we're gonna do is after every release, we're gonna submit a survey or send a survey out to the community. Um, this is you're really gonna target uh, end users and contributors to get feedback on how this is going. Um, what changes do we need to make to, to the process going forward? And I, after we do three of these releases, we're gonna 
take that feedback and make a decision about whether this would become a permanent change or whether we should uh, either revert back to the old way or think of another, do we need to make any other alterations to the process? So 420, 122, 123, 124, we're gonna try to collect that feedback and, uh, and work through the survey results, which is still TBD. Um, we have a couple of, in the, in the, the CAP issue, there's a, a couple of related issues uh, to, to kind of firm that stuff up during the 122 timeframe. Those surveys will typically go out at the end of the release and then we'll catch up um, you know, in the subsequent release to process that information and kind of roll it into the next. So then after we collect those three release um, feedbacks, we will uh, kind of um, synthesize everything together uh, and then uh, revisit this topic um, with a uh, public communication uh, via the mailing list, the SIG release mailing list and um, GitHub issues to kind of figure out whether this is gonna be a permanent change or whether there are additional changes that need to be made. Thanks for pointing that out, Josh. Had it on my paper and totally missed it. I, I had a question for you, Jeremy, if that's all sure. right. Um, I'm kind of curious just to how um, we're going about deciding what counts or like what the goal is for a new release. And like, um, is this exclusive to just the main Kubernetes project or does this also sync up with Kubernetes sync groups? That is a super good question. And uh, that's another topic that's in, under a lot of discussion right now. Um, what, you know, typically the releases are really focused on things that are in the Kubernetes, Kubernetes repo. We do track things that are out of the repo, but there's not a great policy or really um, definition of, of what releases look like for things that are outside of KK. Um, when we talk about the release, we're talking mostly about KK. We do track things and sometimes there are blog posts that go out for those other things, but typically the release itself, so 121, 122, is really building off of things that are in the Kubernetes, Kubernetes repo. What goes into those releases really comes down to what the SIGs want to deliver in that upcoming cycle. Um, the way that a change goes into Kubernetes is through a Kubernetes enhancement proposal or a CAP. Um, authors are responsible for writing those things. The SIGs are responsible for approving and reviewing those things. And then really figuring out what bandwidth do they have to work on these things during the upcoming release. So the, the way we've kind of moved toward um, to collect those things for the release is that SIGs are opting in and telling us the release team, hey, we plan on delivering these things. Um, you know, it could be five things, it could be two things, it could be one thing, it could be zero things. Um, when they opt in and say they're going to deliver these features or these, you know, graduate this thing from alpha to beta or beta to stable, each one of those things comes with a certain number of requirements. Uh, it may have to have a PRR, a production readiness review. It may um, need to have a feature flag change. It may need to have um, additional tests or conformance tests delivered for it. And part of what the release team does is once somebody has opted in and said, hey, we're going to do this thing for the release, the release team is really helping them meet those milestones. So we, you know, we're, we're looking to say uh, your, your cap isn't fully complete. It has to be in the implementable state. It has to have graduation criteria defined. It has to have uh, test plans defined. That's what um, and winds up with something we call enhancements freeze. Then from that point on, code has to be done, and that has to be done by the code freeze period of the release. And again, these things are enforced for the KK repo. Um, obviously, things don't have to land by code freeze because we're not locking down uh, other repos. The, the code freeze mechanism comes into place for the KK repo. So the, the release team is, 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 again, like checking to make sure that all the PRs that are necessary for that work are done, um, making sure that we know about all the PRs that are necessary for that work to be done so we can track it, uh, checking to see if any bugs have been opened, watching CI signal and kind of relating it back to those PRs, and just kind of doing the mechanisms of, of making sure that those things successfully land in the release. But what goes into the release really comes down to the SIG. So if SIG node wants to land some brand new feature, SIG node's really responsible for that feature landing. They're responsible for hitting those deadlines. They're responsible for the cap, um, shepherding it through that process with support from the release team. Does that answer your question? So in, in, in that particular scenario, if, if there was anything that the node SIG group particularly needed from the main code base, it would be up to them to go in and make sure that that happens for, the, for themselves. Yeah, in, in general, SIGs own code, right? So like the SIG node, SIG node owns 
things like the Kubelet, and they own pieces of the Kubernetes, Kubernetes kind of giant repo that are really specific to Signo. Same thing for storage, same thing for API machinery. Um, there are owner's files that land in various places that kind of correspond to the SIGs. And uh, they're responsible for making sure that those things get the proper reviews, that the code gets done. Um, and then I mean, there are other reviews that have to happen too, like outside of just node specific code, there may have to be API reviews that happen. Um, and those are a different set of people, but they're really responsible for ensuring that those things, those checkboxes get done um, before the release happens. If, if those things don't happen, like by enhancements freeze or by code freeze, we remove them from the release. So the, the release team does own some of that. Like we, we have some say over what gets in and we have some mechanisms for kind of clawing things back, but uh, you know, it's, it's a shared responsibility with a lot of responsibility landing on the six. I see, awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty new to the whole project, so I appreciate the thoroughness. Yeah, no worries. Awesome. Any other questions or comments about the release cadence KEP? If you're not comfortable unmuting, you're more than welcome to drop the note in the Zoom chat and I will read it out for you. All right. Well, you can still ask more questions in the Zoom chat, but we'll move on to our next topic. Thank you so much, Jeremy, for all that information. I'm sure a lot of people will find that very interesting on the recording too. Next up, we have the Kube Control Exit Code Overhaul with SIG CLI. And I believe I have someone from SIG CLI on the call to kind of talk up and that's Ricardo, right? Yeah, hello, good afternoon. Welcome. I, that, that's afternoon here. To Hey folks, so yeah, Laura, can I share my screen just a bit? Just uh, I think so. Yeah, I'm going yeah, to... I'm, hold on, I'm setting that up. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> Thanks, Josh. You should be good. Thanks. So I'm going to share my screen just because Josh asked me to show some codes, but I will not show. And I will try to keep in my five minutes. Yeah, so we are trying to normalize the code from kubectl and the best way i think to show you the problem is actually showing showing the problem so the first one is a plugin that i wrote uh, the a plugin that i wrote that that is it with the exit code whatever i put right so if i put and i don't know what is the actually actually the exit code from qctl right the second one is one that we got from kubectl diff which got we returns to us an error code of one but by main page from diff one is if it if it's different two is if in trouble but we didn't have this before like it was returning one for everything and we have a bunch of of error codes that show us actually they don't show nothing to us like if i try to create a cluster role and it validates on the client side i have a, a return code of one or if i try to create an invalid namespace and i get an error code of one as well or maybe if i get some access denied let me show you i promise that's quick yeah. So if I do this inside, I get an unzip code one. So I guess I've shown you what's what's the point here, right? The problem that we get here is anything that you run inside kubectl, you get you get an error code which doesn't doesn't symbolize or doesn't represent what, what, what actually happened. You don't know if the, the error code what is from the client side or from the server side, or even if it's from an external command, like from diff, you cannot delegate that for diff or for a plugin. If a plugin wants to, is it, wants to return a, a different exit code other than one to represent things, we just, we, we, we just don't know, we, it, it can, it, it can use the, the, the error code from, from the plugin and, and simulate that something correctly occurred, but it doesn't, right? So 
the main points points of attention that, that we want, actually, the first one, it's hard to pragmatic, pragmatically distinguish errors from kubectl commands. We, we don't know what error happened, right? We don't know where this error happened. If the, the error happened in the client side or, in, or if it happened in, in the server side, or even if the, it was a C program different error code. And what we want with this cap is to document the possible kubectl exit codes. So the same way that we have in other Unix programs that says, oh, if you got this error code, it, it symbolizes this thing, or if you get the, the, this other error code, it symbolizes the other thing, right? And also to allow to delegate to the to sub commands like diff and plugins to have their own exit codes, but this doesn't, this as this should not impact in the in the error code from kubectl. And we want to gradually implement the exit code standardization for each command. So we still need to resolve how we are going to do that because we can standardize at once, but it, or we can do that gradually, but this 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 might get some impact impacts for the user. And why are we bringing this here? Because we have two possible caveats at least. Right. So the first one is we cannot use well-known exit codes. I I will put the the notes that I'm reading here because I am like I, I, I that there are, there are some links here, and the other one and the mostly notable is CIs or users that already relies on on the behavior of kubectl nowadays. Right. So if they behave on the exit code one. And we say, oh, see, now we are going to say that if an error occurs in the server side, we are going to use the error code 65 to 70. We are going to define those, those exit code ranges. So this might impact in some CI, CD, or even in, in users relying into this in, in scripts. And we have some unresolved needs and things that needs attention. So how how is this behavior going to happen with Windows users? I, I really don't know about that. So probably we, sh we should be folks using kubectl in Windows. And how to deal with pod specific exit code when using kubectl run or kubectl exec. And this is something that we are we are still discussing. I, I already I, I also put in the notes some code navigation if someone wants to know how the commands they they happen inside kubectl with the complete validate and run it's a uh, pretty nice and what how how the error they are delegated but i think that the most the, the most important thing here is that we need the feedback from the community because this is, this might be a breaking change for a lot of ci cd providers or for people relying on on different exit codes so please folks I, I, I really love answering comments that just just help us doing that. Okay. And I guess that's how I don't know if much or Eddie, they want to say something else. No, I think Eddie, uh, Ricardo presented the topic very well. Uh, what I want to probably to add is have a look at the cap. I linked the cap, Ricardo also linked in the notes that he put together. Um, before we start actually writing something, we would love to get as much feedback as possible, since this will be a bigger change that will be with us for probably for the remaining time of the KubeCuddle uh, lifetime. Um, and we don't expect to break that after this happens. The actual implementation should be pretty straightforward. It is the initial discussion and the feedback that we want to gather about the shape of the proposal uh, is critical uh, to kick it off. So we won't be definitely rushing with this. Uh, we will we will just leave it for uh, open for at least this and the next release, and then eventually we'll uh, we will be uh, trying to come up with this. Um, initially hidden behind a feature flag. And uh, if there will be no objections, we will be uh, slowly shipping this towards uh, all of the users. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Anybody have any questions, comments, concerns, things you'd like to just say right away? 
What's up? Go, Bob. <laughs> I, I mentioned this in chat, but um, if you do want to reach out to some end users, we can engage directly with the CNCF end user group and direct them to provide feedback to the CAP. Uh, we've done that before, mostly for surveys. Um, so I don't know if you want to just have them comment directly on the CAP or potentially have um, like a feedback survey or something like that. But either way, we can send something out to them. OK, yeah, we'll, we'll try to figure something uh, that I, I think that people, the end users, might not necessarily be interested in reading the CAP. Uh, so maybe some kind of a survey would be probably the easiest uh, for them to digest. Yeah, thanks, Bob. One of the things I want to make sure we hit is like CI CD practitioners, and there's a bunch of different like users that this will impact in some place. So that's a great idea. The there's also the CNCF maintainer list, which has like Argo or the like CD groups, which has Argo, Jenkins X, and a lot of those providers. So can can boost the visibility through that. I I can send to them. If you think that's good, Bob, I just I just needed mailing list address and I can join same and wait for some feedback as well. Thank I you. can get you that later. Thanks. <clears throat> some of my other questions here is going to be. Um, what plans do we have for user outreach? Because I actually see a lot more potential for breakage, you know, with people's personal bash scripts um, than necessarily with actual um, project plumbing. Um, I think this could be weaved into the larger discussion around how do we talk about changes in the project during the release pro uh, process. Um, it sounds like something that would be feasible to have as a pre-release bloggy thing, um, as well as noted in, uh, in, in the release notes. And um, I guess the, the, all of the release train communication that we do once the release actually goes out. Yeah, I, I think we need to engage the, um, uh, you know, uh, contributor. Well, this isn't really contributor marketing, though. Um, although they probably have some ideas. Because, um, like, one of the questions I have up in the air that I really have no, I don't know, you know, central dilemma is, is it better to have a large message saying, hey, here's the things we're about to break in this release, um, which would actually be nice to have in general. Um, <clears throat> versus um, giving out messages for specific issues. Because always my worry about a roundup uh, message is that people won't read the whole thing and then they'll miss the issue that really applies to them. So I, so we were, yeah, we were actually discussing some of this in SIG release recently. Um, I think that as part of the, as part of any KEP uh, that may, I think it's, I think it's worthwhile to, um, more visibly note when a kept involves a deprecation. Um, and I think as part of that, there could be an addition to the release team checklist that says like, hey, is your thing a deprecation? Here are some additional things that you should do um, to make sure that it's 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 visible to people who might be consuming this, uh, this enhancement. Um, so that doesn't exist today, but I, I agree that the, um, for the, uh, talking about wide scale changes. Um, some folks mentioned contributor marketing. I think it's important that the SIG, uh, the SIG, SIG docs, uh, SIG release and contributor marketing are involved in whatever that communication plan is. I mean, for this particular change, and I, I think that could easily um, apply to similar broader changes is promoting the change um discussing about it and making sure that it is not on by default so you need to explicitly set some i don't know flag environment variable something to opt in provide the feedback 
and in the early stages speak up about it and you know at the early stage we'll be uh, open about oh yeah it will change uh, but you can already provide feedback from something working because from my personal experience i know that there are people um, more willing to provide feedback when they could give it a try rather than uh, theoretize on problem. Uh, one of the things that I had in mind too was, is there any sort of mailing list or circle for people who provide managed Kubernetes as a service, like the cloud providers and some of the other SaaS companies? Because that's a great way to get folks to ask their customers directly. So the CNCF has a list. Cool. Uh, all right. So we did this reboot with only 30 minutes on the clock. Uh, so we are at time, um, but I know some people probably really wanna keep talking. So I don't think we can, we can stop if folks wanna keep talking about different topics, we're welcome to stay on. Um, I do wanna just take a quick note or two for the folks who do need to hop off. There are like 4.5 chain uh, pages of shout outs that I'm not gonna read out like I normally would do at the end of a community meeting please do go check those and we will read them out at the next community meeting. But shout out to just everybody. Thanks all for coming. We really appreciate you joining us for this new experiment of the community meeting being more of a discussion format. And again, if you have any feedback on that, you're welcome to reach out and folks can stay on and keep talking. But I wanted I, to make sure I got that in there for folks who have to jump off. I have a quick one before we stop the recording. Um, so just to back mm -hmm. up on the upcoming patch uh, schedule, uh, what we were discussing within um, ha what by having one additional uh, 118 release um, was to line it up with the uh, the current patch, uh, the upcoming patches. Um, so the release date for um, apparently can't edit the the working doc, but the release date for uh, 11819. The cherry pick deadline is May 7th and the release target will be May 12th. Awesome. Thank you for that correction. And yep. it looks like somebody did get in there and correct it before the doc went in and out again. So I think we're good. Awesome. So. Yay. Right. There is actually a question in the chat about changes and normalization around errors originating from Cuba via CRI or CNI. I don't know if that's no, a new no, topic. Not, not really a question. It's more of a just a, a point of order. If we start okay. doing normalization, I'd be interested. We, we, we can certainly okay. help out in the container runtimes to make these error messages easier to consume. Um, we, we do. We put a lot of useful information in our logs. And you're not going to get all that back in the error message. Sometimes the error message you receive is the final error message, and it, it may not make any sense. Um, for example, if you're doing a, some kind of a pull image or run, you may not get the error you, you would get if you read the entire logs. Well, we tried over here, we tried over there. Um, you know, sometimes one error doesn't really explain the whole thing. So it just, just adds up. We, we, we can help. At the cry level, um, I might I might suggest uh, including that as a a note to both um, Sig Node and Sig Network uh, mailing lists just to get that conversation started. I'm not sure that enough people who are over those areas are on this call right now. Yeah, I was surprised to find this call today. <laughs> so, like, whoops, it wasn't in my calendar. Yeah, we had a little bit of an issue with the um, Google Calendar. So short version is we're quite large <laughs> as a group. And apparently that causes some problems for our uh, community calendar. So we're going to be working on that eventually. Um, but that hopefully might explain why it appeared and then disappeared. And then there were emails. So I apologize on that one. Um, which, which emails? Because I want to make sure I get that into the notes. It was SIG networking. And what was the other one? SIG node. SIG node. Thank you.
Um, and Dims may have additional suggestions. Um, Honestly, it might be worth just sending one out to KDEV. Yeah, there's already a, th um, a thread in KDEV for the um, CLI exit code. So oh, cool. The um, Just to add to that. OK. Somebody had raised his hand here, but then he disappeared from Zoom, so. Well, hopefully they'll come back. But on that note, I think we're kind of uh, hitting the end of the conversation today. So again, thank you so much for sticking around a little bit longer than the original invite that disappeared that reappeared, that disappeared, uh, actually had on the calendar. I hope you all found something very interesting, but thank you all for coming. I hope this was useful and we will see you next month. Take care, folks. Thank you. Bye.